Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Anna Mateo and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Anna Mateo. Some people do not want to drink alcohol, but still want to enjoy a special drink at a celebration, party, or a night out with friends. In the recent past, in the United States, those people had limited choices. They could celebrate with overly sweet non-alcoholic wine or watery non-alcoholic beer. Well, not anymore. As more people decide to cut out alcohol, there are more choices of non-alcoholic drinks. Drink makers are creating beverages that are tastier, more interesting, and even healthy. Interest in not drinking alcohol has been growing for years. Now there are more choices at restaurants and drinking places called bars. Some bars now even specialize in alcohol-free drinks. The pandemic led some people to examine alcohol. For health or weight loss reasons, many people cut down or just stopped altogether. In the U.S., brothers Massimo and Louis Borelli noted a growing interest for non-alcoholic drinks during the pandemic. Europe, and Britain in particular, have been leaders of the high-quality, non-alcoholic drinks market. Borelli said that three years ago, there were only about 15 to 20 good non-alcoholic products available. Now, he says, there are over 200, with more coming. So back in October 2020, they created an online marketplace for non-alcoholic beverages. They called it No and Low. Louis Borelli says there are three main kinds of non-alcoholic and low-alcoholic products for sale at No and Low. First are products that recreate individual alcohols, like rum and gin, but without the alcohol content. Second, he said, are mocktails, mixed drinks that do not contain alcohol. Many mocktails include some of the flavors found in alcoholic drinks. And third, Borelli said, are drinks that are all their own thing. They do not try to copy alcoholic drinks, but instead offer a different drinking experience. He added that many of these products are often good for you. On the website The Kitchen, food and drink writer Kelly Foster offers some tips or advice on how to make your own mocktails. She suggests using fresh seasonal items available in your area. With cooler autumn temperatures, Use flavors like pear, apple, sage, and rosemary. In summery warm temperatures, try peach, watermelon, mango, mint, and basil. She says balancing flavors is critical to making a good drink. Some non-alcoholic drinks can be too sweet. So, she suggests adding sour and bitter flavors to balance out the sweet. For sour flavors, 
she says to use fruits like citrus, cranberries, and tamarind. Different vinegars can also add sour flavor. And do not forget spices that add heat. Cinnamon, star anise, and ginger can spice up your drink. You can even use peppercorns for extra heat and flavor. These warmer spices are especially nice for cooler summer or autumn nights. Make the drinks look as pretty as alcoholic cocktails. Use a pretty glass and add a garnish. This could be a flower, a piece of fruit, or an herb that rests on the glass. A good garnish not only makes the drink prettier, but sometimes they tell you about the drink. A drink garnished with lemon or mint probably contains those flavors. I'm on. Drug maker Pfizer says new data shows its COVID 19 vaccine is safe and protective for children. Aged 5 to 11. The company said Monday it will seek U.S. approval for the shot to be used in children in this age group as soon as possible. Pfizer developed the vaccine jointly with its German partner, BioNTech. Last month, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Or FDA gave full approval to the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to be used in all individuals over the age of 16. The vaccine has also been available under emergency use for people 12 to 15 years old. In trials involving 5 to 11 year olds, Pfizer tested a smaller dose, about one third the amount given in current shots. Pfizer officials said with the smaller dose, children ages five to eleven still developed coronavirus fighting antibody levels just as strong as teenagers and young adults. Getting full strength injections. The children's dosage was also shown to be safe, causing similar or fewer temporary side effects than experienced by teens. Pfizer senior vice president Dr. Bill Gruber told the Associated Press, "Such effects can include pain in the arm, fever." And body aches. Gruber, who specializes in child medical care, said researchers really hit the sweet spot with the latest vaccine. He added that Pfizer and BioNTech aim to seek emergency approval from the FDA by the end of the month for use in this age group. They also plan to seek government approval in the European Union and Britain. Earlier this month, FDA Chief Dr. Peter Marks said once Pfizer provided its results, his agency would examine the data in a matter of weeks to consider approval of the vaccine. Pfizer said it studied the lower dose of the two-shot vaccine in more than 2,200 children aged 5 to 11. The FDA only required what is called a bridging study to be carried out. The study aimed to find out whether the younger children developed antibody levels. Already proven to be protective in teens and adults, Pfizer and BioNTech announced the findings Monday in a news release, 
while noting that the study is still going on. Researchers said there have not yet been enough COVID-19 cases to compare rates of effectiveness between the vaccinated and those given a placebo. That data is expected to provide additional results. Both the Pfizer vaccine and another one developed by Moderna have been linked to rare cases of heart inflammation in teens and young adults, mostly in young men. But Pfizer said the researchers did not see such cases in the new trial. Moderna is also studying its shots in younger school-aged children. And both Pfizer and Moderna are studying vaccine use for babies as young as six months old. Those results are expected later in the year. Children generally face a lower risk of severe illness or death from COVID-19 than older people. However, more than 5 million children in the U.S. have tested positive for COVID-19 since the pandemic began, and at least 460 have died, the American Academy of Pediatrics reports. Cases in immune response, Pfizer reported, appears likely to be protective. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites the World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English, welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time, we talked about the election of Martin Van Buren as the 8th President of the United States. Van Buren had served as President Andrew Jackson's Secretary of State and later his Vice President. Jackson asked his political party the Democrats, to nominate Van Buren as their presidential candidate in the 1836 election. The Whig party was against him, but their opposition was divided. Van Buren won the election easily. Jackson stood beside Van Buren as the new president was sworn in at the Capitol building in Washington. Physically, the two men were very different. Jackson was tall, with long white hair that flowed back over his head. Jackson's health had been poor during the last few months he spent in the White House. He seemed tired. There was almost no color in his face. Van Buren was much shorter than Jackson and had much less hair. His eyes were brighter than those of the old man next to him. In his inaugural speech, Van Buren noted that he was the first American born after the revolution to become president of the United States. He was also the first president who was not from a British family. 
His family was Dutch. Van Buren said he felt he belonged to a later age. He called for more unity among Democrats of the North and South. He said better times were ahead for the country. Martin Van Buren had a poor education as a boy. He went to school only for a few years. His father was a farmer and hotel keeper at a small town in New York State. Politicians, including Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, had sometimes visited the hotel. By listening to them and others, the future president learned about politics. Eventually, Van Buren studied in a law office and became a lawyer. In the first years of his career, he defended tenants and renters who were fighting large plantation owners for their land. As a result, he developed a reputation for helping the common man. Van Buren became a local official and then a senator and governor of New York. When he was 24, he married a young woman he had grown up with. But she died of tuberculosis after 12 years, leaving him with four sons. And after that, he was known as quite charming among the ladies, as they said in those days. Historian Joel Silby is an expert on Martin Van Buren. Mr. Silby says most people who knew Van Buren liked him. He seemed warm and friendly. He tried to keep his political life and his social life separate. It was not unusual to see him exchange handshakes, smiles, and jokes with men who were his political enemies. But he did not have a national reputation like Andrew Jackson had. What he was known for and what got him into the vice presidency and then the presidency was that he was Jackson's right-hand man. Van Buren had been president for just a few days when an economic crisis struck the country. The crisis had been building for months. It really began with the death of the Bank of the United States more than a year before. The bank had been so strong that it was able to control the economy throughout most of the country. It also helped control smaller state banks. It refused to accept the notes or paper money of these banks unless the state banks could exchange the paper for gold or silver money. President Jackson had opposed the Bank of the United States. He vetoed a bill that would have continued it. After the powerful bank closed, a number of new state banks opened. All of them produced large amounts of paper money, many times the amount they could exchange for gold or silver. Business speculators used much of this paper money to buy land from the government. These men bought the land, held it for a while, then sold it for more than they paid. The government soon found itself with millions of dollars of paper money of questionable value. To stop these activities, Jackson had ordered only gold or silver payments for government land. But many banks did not have enough gold to cover the paper notes. At the same time, American agriculture was having trouble. In 1835 and 1837, many crops failed. American traders had to import farm products from Europe, and they had to pay for them in gold or silver. In the spring of 1837, just as Martin Van Buren was taking office, the demand on banks for gold and silver grew too heavy. 
The banks stopped honoring their promises to exchange their paper money for gold. They said the suspension was just temporary, that it was necessary to stop for a while all payments in gold or silver. The crisis became worse. Many of the weaker state banks closed. Those that stayed open had almost no money to lend. Businessmen could not pay back money they owed the banks, and they could not get loans to keep their businesses open. Many factories closed. Great numbers of people were out of work, and prices rose higher and higher. Most people struggled to buy food and other necessities. The price of flour and meat doubled between 1835 and 1837. Even coal, the fuel people used to heat their homes, cost two times as much. Violence finally broke out at a protest meeting in New York City. Some in the crowd demanded action against the rich traders. About 1,000 people marched to a store, forced their way into it, and destroyed large amounts of flour and grain. Businessmen blamed the government for the economic depression. They said the biggest reason was a decision former President Jackson made. Jackson's order required the government to accept only gold or silver for government land. Opponents said the order had caused fear and mistrust. Even some of Jackson's strongest supporters said it should be lifted. They said the measure had done its job of ending land speculation. Now, they said, it was hurting the economy. Two of President Van Buren's closest advisors urged him to continue the order. Lifting it, they argued, would flood the federal government with worthless paper money. Van Buren was troubled. The federal government had already lost $9 million because of bank failures. The president wanted to make sure the government had enough money. And he wanted this money safe until needed. Yet he did not believe the federal government had the responsibility for ending the depression. And historian Joel Silby says Van Buren did not believe the government had the right to interfere in any way with private business. He said that over and over again, that the federal government doesn't have the power to do this. Mr. Silby adds that Van Buren's political philosophy grew out of the beliefs of former President Thomas Jefferson. All of his life, Van Buren claimed to be a Jeffersonian Democrat. That had very specific meaning to him. Limited government, uh, freedom for people, meaning white males. He was an egalitarian within the limits of those years. Van Buren also shared Jackson's suspicion of bankers. In general, he believed no group, neither the government nor the wealthy, should have too much power, not even to help the economy. So Van Buren decided to continue Jackson's order. No government land could be bought with paper money. The American economy got worse. The president called a special meeting of Congress. In a message to lawmakers, Van Buren said, overbanking and overtrading had caused the depression. He proposed several steps to protect the government. One of them was for Congress to pass a law permitting the government to keep its own money in the Treasury. America's Treasury Department received money when it collected import taxes 
and sold land. It used this money to pay what the government owed. The Treasury did not, however, hold the money from the time it was collected to the time it was paid out. The Treasury put the money in private banks. President Van Buren wanted to end this custom. He wanted a law to let the Treasury keep government money in its own secure places. The Whigs criticized Van Buren for thinking only of protecting the federal government and not helping businessmen, farmers, and the states. Some Democrats, who believed strongly in states' rights, also opposed Van Buren's idea. All these opponents provided enough votes in Congress to defeat the proposal. Van Buren tried again the following year to get approval for an independent treasury. Again, the proposal was defeated. Finally, in June 1840, Congress passed a law enabling the Treasury Department to hold government money itself. Van Buren signed what was called the Independent Treasury Bill. But the economic depression continued. Martin Van Buren also faced an international challenge from a surprising place. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History, from VOA Learning English. That's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.